Um, we're going to get started here. I'm a, I'm a board member with the Historical Society of Haddonfield and welcome to tonight's virtual lecture series, Visualizing the Past in Lawnside by Chanel Jordan. We are so excited to be co-sponsoring tonight's lecture with the Lawnside Historical Society. But before I turn it over to Linda Shockley, president of the Lawnside Historical Society for um, our speaker introductions, just a couple quick bits of housekeeping. Um, if you haven't done so already, please mute. Um, also, Shamel is going to try to take questions at the end. So please use the chat box to ask questions. And lastly, tonight's presentation is being recorded. It will be available on the HSH YouTube site. Um, and finally, just a, a thank you, um, the Historical Society of Haddonfield in these uh, difficult times is trying so hard to bring uh, everyone virtual programming like this, um, as well as other virtual programming. So I would encourage you, if you haven't done so, to visit HaddonfieldHistory.org, our newly designed website, and see what's coming up and join us. Um, but most of all, thank you to our supporters and members. Um, we couldn't be doing this without you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda Shockley. Thanks so much, Karina, for this program together with the Historical Society of Haddonfield. And we're so proud of Shamel, who is uh, a child of Lawn Side and the Toomer family further down the White Horse Pike which I think has led her to so much interest in history and the intersection with genealogy. She's a wonderful genealogist. She's done workshops for the Historical Society. And right now she and retired social studies teacher Munira Higgs are involved in a wonderful project with Lawnside school children, creating postcards that connect them with points of historical significance in the community. So they're working with third to eighth graders and they're having a great time. So we're just so excited to be able to offer um, this program together with you with an award-winning historian and genealogist, uh, Shamel Jordan. Thanks so much. Take it away, Shamel. Third to... Um be invited uh, to be here with you today. And I'm so honored to have the opportunity to share a passion of mine with you. Um, a while ago I heard, and I think I might've heard this from Mr. Gaines in Lawnside that only a fool works for a living. And I didn't understand it then, but I totally get it now. You know, once you find that sweet spot of, you know, desire and passion and, you know, for me, that's genealogy. And so I am so thankful to get a chance to talk to you about um, a program that I created called Visualizing the Past. And it's really about youth genealogy. Um, are you guys able to see my screen? Fantastic. Um, so first, just a little bit about me. Um, I am a producer and creator of a show called Genealogy Quick Start, um, which is uh, produced at Philly Cam, now produced on <laughs> Facebook and YouTube. Um, you can see it there live every other Thursday. Uh, this being one third, one week actually tomorrow, we will be going live talking about uh, finding that uh, Indian in the family. Um, so definitely take a, a look at that. You can go to genealogyquickstart.com to find out more um, about me. So you guys get this. I can't tell this anywhere else in the world, but I am exit 29A. <laughs> I was born and raised, as Linda said, and she had to be really careful because my family is like, you know, Lawnside, once you're in Lawnside, they claim you. Like there is no getting out of the clutches of being a child of Lawnside once you're there. But my family whispers in my ear to remind me, you know, you're a tumor, right? You know, you're from Berlin. So yes, I am from both Berlin and Lawnside. Um, and so as I told you, my passion is genealogy. And this is the man, my cousin Floyd Riley, 
who got me started in genealogy. And like I always say, I don't know whether to love him more or really just, you know, dislike him because it has taken over my life. Um, he is a charter member of a group called the African American Genealogy Group in Philadelphia. Um, if you are not a member of a genealogy group, you definitely have to get some buddies because they will help you out. Historical society folks, you guys know this. Um, really good to be in a group. As a, after, you know, spending time with AAGG, eventually I started traveling and spending my time at the Institute of Genealogy and Historical Research in Birmingham, Alabama at Sanford University. And we just recently moved to the University of Georgia. Um, you see here on the left, this is me and Floyd and my buddy after doing intermediate DNA. So this is how we ended up at the airport, just a little twisted, but you know genealogy can do that to you. The reason I bring this institute up is because one year, I think it was 2006, we learned how to GPS cemeteries to create maps. And that fascinated me. I thought, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Like this was so long ago that our cell phones didn't have GPS. I had to go out and get this big giant thing called a GPS receiver or, yeah. And that you went out, a Garmin, I think you either got a Garmin or you got a Tom Tom. And we all showed up in Birmingham and we went to this old cemetery and we just hit points where the headstones were. And we went back to the classroom at the university. They connected our GPSs to the laptop and boom, we had a map. And I said, oh, I have to do this somewhere else. And so as luck would have it, you know, Lawnside is always an enterprising town and the men's association had made a list of all the veterans. And I said, hmm, maybe I'll start here. Maybe I will start with the Civil War soldiers because, you know, I was just fascinated by the fact that there are nearly 150 Civil War soldiers buried in Lawnside. And so uh, with the help of a friend, we set off to um, try out this new skill of platting cemeteries. And so in Lawnside, there are three burial locations, Mount Pisgah, Mount Zion, and Mount Peace. And there are about 25 or so in Mount Pisgah, about 25 or so at Mount Zion, and nearly 100 at Mount Peace Cemetery, which is right on the White Horse Pike and at the corner of Moldy Road. And so I was, you know, we jumped out, did a, did it, tried it out at Mount Pisgah, very easy to do, tried it out at Mount Zion. And to be honest, I was kind of afraid of Mount Pisgah. I said, you know, 50 is good for me. I've learned enough. You know, I've practiced this skill. But my friend pressed me on, Andrea McDonald. She said, let's do Mount Peace. And we completed Mount Peace. And we created a map that looked similar to this. So we took pictures of all the headstones. We GPS located the area, which put this map down. And we also transcribed all of the headstones. So someone could come in here and they could see a list of all the soldiers buried there that we had found, click on them and get all this fabulous detail. Um, I was very excited about this. Linda uh, Shockley, the Historical Society, I let her know about it and she said, I know you guys are historians, genealogists, so you'll understand this when I tell you this. After spending all this time in this cemetery with these guys, I wanted to know more. Um, seeing all these headstones, like why are, why are so many even buried here on Lawnside? Who are these guys? And so the genealogists and me led me down to the National Archives where I decided that I was going to collect all this, the um, military service records and all the pension packets. And, you know, pension packets can be anywhere from five to 100 pages, usually averaging about 50 um, a packet. And I didn't care. I just started taking the train. And I told Linda, and Linda was like, um, Shamel, 
um, I think you need to talk to Giles Wright and maybe uh, get a grant or something for this. And so I talked to Giles Wright, who, you know, Miss Giles, no longer with us. Um, he was the director of the African American History Program um, at the State's Historical Commission in Trenton. And he said, you need to stop spending your own money. And so he helped me to write my first ever grant to um, help me to fund this project, to collect as much information as I can on these soldiers. And having all that information, you know, I had to share it with everybody, you know. I was already a genealogical lecturer, but I got a chance to travel the country um, letting people know about these soldiers. Let me tell you guys a little bit about these soldiers. So one person that most people know about is John Lawson. John Lawson was a Medal of Honor winner. Uh, he was a landsman on the USS Harford, and he was born and lived in Philadelphia. And he's buried at Mount Peace Cemetery. And there was, you know, there was a long time where he didn't even have a headstone, absolutely nothing there. And the Men's Association, the Historical Society, the board at Mount Peace, so Yolanda Romero's here. Thank you for coming to support Yolanda. Um, Yolanda is, um, her father was very instrumental in, you know, uh, the board and she took on, you know, leadership. And eventually he now has a headstone that is there at Mount Peace, but he's such an interesting man um, beyond just his, his dash or his dates or this medal. It's really, this is a headstone that's there now. Um, it's, uh, I was able to um, find this article on him that tells you about, you know, why he became a Medal of Honor. Um, and they said Lawson was wounded um, in the leg and thrown with great violence. I love how they dramatize, great violence against the side of the ship. But soon he recovered himself, though begged to go below. He went back to the shell whip where he remained during the action. And John Lawson said, you know, he'd rather die fighting, you know? So he let them, they let them have his way and he remained at his post until the battle was over. And this battle was the Battle of Mobile Bay. And John Lawson, you can tell just from his reaction to this, he was such a humble guy. Um, he let us know that he left his wife and five children at home to enlist in the Navy. As a young person, he um, had a job as a steward and he went to fight with Admiral Farragut, who's very, very, very famous. And the USS Harford was also very famous. And when he found out that he won this honor, he thought that his friends were making a joke on him. He, he had to call down to Washington to make sure this was true. And they told him, yes, indeed, Mr. Lawson, you did win the Medal of Honor. I had the uh, uh, pleasure, uh, thanks to the Historical Society and Linda, to meet two descendants of John Lawson, L Lisa Pierce, um, an educator, and Jay West. That's her handle. I can't remember Jay, but that's her Facebook handle. I can't remember what Jay West's real name is, but Jay and Lisa, it's really an honor uh, to know you guys. Another soldier there buried is Albert Tillman. And Albert Tillman was actually drafted into the Civil War. And he said he didn't want to be drafted. He wanted to go in. He wanted to enlist on his own. And so when he found out he was drafted, he ran away to Camp William Penn so that he can enlist on his own. And what is uh, I'm actually uh, fascinating about Albert Tillman and what made going down to the archives and all these trips worthwhile is that I got to look into the eyes of Albert Tillman. This is the one photograph that was not known but was found when I was copying his pension packets. And that day, everyone on the second floor at the National Archives also knew about this photo because <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I mean, like to find this photo of someone who's 
records you've been reading. Um, and he was very proud. The reason why this photo was in the packet is because he had to, um, he changed his name. He changed his name to enlist at Camp William Penn. He changed his name, um, I believe his name, oh, he, he took the name of Henry Buck. And so he had to prove himself. He wanted a pension. And so he gave this picture that he took at Camp William Penn um, to take to, to, to the pension examiner, to take who, to whomever, to prove that this indeed was him so that he can get his pension. And he said, please, please turn this picture back. Give me this picture back. And I'm so happy that they did not, that the government kept the picture. Another man is George Farmer. George Farmer, um, he was a proud fighter. He was one of more than a few men who left the state and um, heeded the call and joined in the 54th Mass. Some of them also joined in the 5th Mass. And um, he was wounded, actually wounded at the battle that is dramatized in the movie Glory. Um, and he was promoted. He went from a private to a corporal. And this is proof in his pension packet um, that shows, oh, no, this one is actually in his military um, service record that he was actually wounded uh, during this battle. So I'm not sure which actor on Glory was George Farmer. Maybe one day I'll know, uh, but he was there. This one is fascinating because I didn't know that Lincoln paid for, for um, slaves. So people, in order to keep the border states from seceding from the Union, Lincoln said, hey, free your men. I will give you $300 when you enlist them into the Union Army. And this is one man, uh, James Robinson, who um, was free to enlist. His, his owner, Anadasia Robbins, enlisted him in the Army from Maryland. And the man actually ended up becoming a POW. He got captured during the war. So here he is, enslaved, then freed, then captured again. So James' final resting place is in Lawnside. He lived in Camden. This one is fascinating. Um, Horace Pierce, what's fascinating about Horace is that his mother was questioned. And she tells the story of who her owner was, who Horace's owner was, who Horace's father's owner was. So we can take Horace from um, Lawnside back to um, Maryland uh, using his mother's deposition in his pension packet. This is a, uh, another soldier, him and his brother um, fought as well. Um, this is William Benson, who is the ancestor of um, Reverend Benson, uh, the husband of Mrs. Benson uh, of the Postal Service. Um, this is his ancestor, and they, he also fought in uh, uh, the Civil War. And so it was amazing to be able to get to know all these guys and have all of this information. Uh, my next steps were to create a, a website, uh, Snow Hill Genealogy. You can go there and see information about them. Um, but then years later, I had a problem. Technology changes. And my beautiful map went from this to something crazy that's like, unrecognizable, something that I was a little less, I was still proud, you know, I still was proud I did the work, but I was a little less proud of. And I really needed to fix this. You know, I wanted it to be available forever for people to have access to. And so I needed to figure out what to do. And so Hey, I love technology. It would have been very easy for me to just figure out, you know, the newest map software and create it. But I said, the real problem isn't to fix what the map looks like. The real problem is I need more people like me. I need more people who uh, have been exposed to Lawnside history or love Lawnside history or been exposed to it as a child as I was 
plant seeds so that they can feel that this is important to them as, impor as it is important to me. And so that's why I decided to start visualizing the past and to go back to my middle school and to use genealogy and technology to make history interesting. Um, history was interesting to me, but not as interesting as it has become with doing genealogy. I've always been told that, you know, history was in my backyard. I've always been proud of my um, heritage being um, from Lawnside and knowing that. And I really wanted to share that with the youth in Lawnside. And so that's why I decided to um, start a program um, that would take them there and connect them with these Civil War soldiers. So what do you think happens when students spend time learning history in their town cemetery? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about what happened and it was amazing. Um, in 2017, I spent about six weeks with the students. Uh, the eighth graders actually do the Civil War. I spent about, I'd go in uh, during their 42 minutes and we talk about different aspects of first, you know, what was the Civil War? Uh, what did it mean to be black during that time? Um, what were the different castes? You know, there were enslaved people, of course there were free people, and then there were people who were in between. There were bound people. And what did that mean? Um, I talked to them about the fact that the Civil War wasn't just in their books. It was right down the street. And so we put them all on the bus and we took them down the street to Mount Peace Cemetery. And Mr. Hoover, who happens to be the social study teacher for the middle school, we decided because we happened to have some technical difficulties, <laughs> we decided to have a Civil War um, scavenger hunt. And instead of the students having access to my maps, they had to go through the cemetery and figure out who the soldiers were based off of when they were born and what was on the headstones. And they each, they had the groups, we grouped them up and they had to find 10. And um, once they found 10, they would receive, you know, awards and prizes and mostly they're donuts. They are suckers for those munchkins. You just go across the street to those Dunkin' Donuts. They love those things. So we had iPads and I was really afraid because they were naked iPads. They had no covers. And I don't know if you guys know, these tablets are so slippery. When I first got my iPad, I dropped it like three times, like within the first five minutes. So I was really nervous. Um, but when we went to the cemetery, they were just running, enjoying themselves. Not one iPad was broken. They found their 10. They were rushing back and forth to Mr. Hoover to prove they had gotten their 10. It was just an amazing time. The teachers, we had three additional teachers in addition to Mr. Hoover who were out there helping them out. And even the bus driver was like, what's up with these students? They were just happy and giddy and just running around. And guess what? They finished all this work in half the time. They mapped that entire cemetery in half the time. I was astonished. So my dream, and this was my evil little desire, and I'll share it with just you guys, don't tell anybody, but my desire is that middle school is rife as a incubator for little genealogists because they are so inquisitive and they, these students proved it. They proved it because they were sponges. And so what we did with, um, um, like I said, I was impressed with them. Um, this was the group, not that many of them to be able to go through there and do all those headstones. <clears throat> it was amazing. It was amazing. 
Um, no arguing, no fussing. You know, they had the little boy girl thing chasing around, but in, they were just happy, enjoying their time and learning. So what happened after that is the whole point of it was to create story maps. And we used software called ArcGIS and story maps are available. They're free to everyone. They're available online. And what we did is we took um, the points that we mapped plus pictures of the headstones, uh, genealogical records, census records, and pictures, and we created story maps. So we had what we call media day, and we broke the students up into groups, and they had time in the library to work. Each of them had different soldiers. They worked on um, their story map, and I'll um, show you one of the story maps in a second. Um, but in addition to working in the library, and they did get themselves in trouble at the library. They were super wild in the library, I think, because they didn't have that beautiful uh, fresh air. I think fresh air makes a difference. So kids in cemeteries, very good. But they, they, they got their work done. Um, in addition to that, I really wanted to bring it alive. So I had my friend um, Earl Weeks, who was a proud member of the 3rd Regiment of the USCT in Philadelphia, come to um, Lawnside School and um, talk to the students about what it meant uh, to be a soldier. Um, he had his uniform on, talked to them about the shoes that they were both, they could go on either foot, you know, <laughs> no difference. Um, he brought, uh, the main thing that Mr. Me and Mr. It was really weird that we both had the same thing. Uh, the first thing I thought was, where are we going to set up outside so that Earl could shoot his gun so he could have the students have shoot the gun and make some excitement for the students. So I said, Hey, Earl, you know, where should we set up so you could shoot your gun? And he said, Shamel, you know, it's not all about that. It's, you know, it's not about shooting the gun. It's about the children understanding. I was like, you know, Earl, that makes sense. So I said, hey, Mr. Hoover, I'm going to have Earl come. And Mr. Hoover said, oh, man, we can have him shoot his gun. And I said, you know, Mr. Hoover, it's not about that. It's really not about that. So I was able to school Mr. Hoover. Earl not only schooled me and Mr. Hoover, but he also schooled the students. They got to touch shackles. They got to wear hats. They got to wear uh, the jackets. Uh, they made me take these pictures very quickly. They said, I'll put the hat on. You better take it really quickly. And they froze and they took the pictures, but they really um, enjoyed um, seeing and getting a chance to feel uh, a part of history. Um, and so this is one of the um, story maps. And this one is one for um, John Lawson. It's not the whole one, but they were able to put up basically what a story map is images and a small story. And you basically just have, go along the images and view the story. And so this is the USS Harford, um, picture of the USS Harford. And when you go to the next picture, this shows an image of the Battle of Mobile Bay. Um, probably the first image was that picture that you've seen already of John Lawson with his medals on his chest. Um, and then you have um, where he is buried at Mount Peace Cemetery. Um, and then there's one that shows a census record, which I don't have here, and it lists information about him, him uh, genealogically. And so each student received a certificate of appreciation, and they received, they all got, they had, um, we played a game of Kahoot at the end, and um, based off of the winners, they were able to get um, uh, little prizes. They love their suckers for dollar store gifts. So go to the dot. Don't be ashamed of those dollar store gifts. Get those dollar store gifts. And I allowed them to come and shop and pick their little gifts. Um, so 
you know, what happens when students spend time learning history in their own town cemetery? Well, hopefully they gain a bigger appreciation for history in their backyard. Um, but I'm hoping that what happens is that some seeds are planted, that, that when they go down Moldy Road now, and when they go to Home Depot, they don't just see an old cemetery with headstones, that they see men who fought, men who were not just um, sitting back waiting for freedom, but were free, but actively participated to free others. Hopefully they see that African Americans and that these men weren't just one type of person, that they came from different social classes, that they had different um, lives, but that history is no longer in the books, that history is all around them. And so hopefully, uh, They'll remember this just as I remembered the things that were taught to me. Um, so I'm so grateful to those students um, for their time and for their excitement. The time that I spent sharing with them ignited me in ways that I, I never could have imagined. Um, I'm thankful to Ron Johnson, Dr. Ron Johnson, Miss Paula um, Davis, and the teachers who invited me in um, and allowed me to do this. I'm thankful to uh, Linda Shockley, the Lawnside Historical Society. I'm thankful to the Men's His Association for just creating that list. Look what happened from that, that list. They spent time leaving their houses, grouping up and going and walking through the cemetery. I doubt that any of them thought that this would happen. Thank you, Giles, for paying for those records so we could learn more. And I dedicate all of this to three teachers who really um, impressed me and embraced me when I came to Lawnside. And that is Mrs. Long, Mr. Gaines, and Mrs. Morales. And I definitely wanna thank you guys for your support. Those of you who have supported me through this. And I thank you for really wanting to use those of you who really wanted to um, hear about this. And thank you Haddonfield Historical Society for inviting me to talk about this. And I wanna share one last thing. Uh, Linda threw this in there. I'll tell you about 2021. 2021, I decided I wanted to do 20 days of Lawnside history for Lawnside students. So along with Manira Higgs, um, Mrs. Higgs for 30, over 30 years at the Lawnside School, she taught the students there. Um, she's a historian, teacher, Fulbright scholar. She helped to write these cards together. Uh, we created over 200 kits. And each week we're doing meetups with the students, talking about five of the cards. And we're challenging the students to take the lawn side challenge, go out and take a video, take an image or create something unique with your voice. And week one, I'm blown away uh, by what they've done. They've created animations. One of the third graders created a one minute history minute. You must know this history. It's adorable. One youth created, drew the 1844 map, part of it, and then drew the map the way it is today. And he went through and explained to you all the differences between 1844 and today. And so I'm just so inspired by youth. If you're ever depressed about life, go hang out with youth and, and share with them because they'll let you know that the future is bright. It really is. And um, I really enjoyed um, spending time letting them know that history is right in their backyard. So thank you very much. <laughs> At least. Thanks so much, you know.
Very good. Very good. So, so here are some questions for you. Uh, first of all, can you explain why Albert Tillman en enlisted with another name? So he said the reason he enlisted with another name is because he didn't want them to find him. If he listed with his real name, they, he felt that they would have found him. So he took on a new name, a new persona, so that he can enlist as a free man, as opposed to a bound, drafted man. That meant a lot to him. Oh, so can I ask just a follow up? So when you say a bound, drafted man, was he one of these people who was uh, free for the purpose of going into the service in a border state? Or was he uh, a New Jerseyan or an indentured servant? What exactly was his status? So so he was, um, he was in Delaware. He was a Delaware man and he was indentured. He was indentured and um, he was drafted. Mm -hmm. okay. So here's another question. This is being passed along to, from Cheryl Lynn. Are you planning any interpretation at the gravestones using the story map information like an iPhone tour or that kind of info in the cemetery? I'm planning on everything that they let me do. Whatever they let me do, that's what I'm doing. Um, right now, I am, as a part of this um, postcard project, I'm kind of tricking the kids into creating content. So think about it. They're creating content for this historical stuff. Now all I have to do is plop them on a map of Lawnside. So that'll be probably one of the next things. But I have a thousand ideas. And what I really want to do is the youth to drive that. Mm -hmm. Great. So was the town originally called Snow Hill? This is one of our favorite questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, so... Um, the oldest name that I found so far, um, and that is a, a 1792, um, Mount Pisgah was called Snow Hill Church. I have a map, 1801, where they label it Snow Hill Church. And so that is one of, that is the oldest name that I've seen for Snow Hill, for Lawrenceide. And Linda, feel free, the historian Munira might be here, feel free to chime in if, if that's okay. That's, that, that's a good one. Here's another question. Are the cemeteries open for visiting daily or just on special days? Well, why'd you ask that? You're opening me up to tell you the trick, what was going on. So please know that they are private cemeteries, right? And I did not go unscathed. Um, just walking in, you know, I just walked in. And so you want to be careful and, you know, contact the churches if you'd like to visit their cemeteries. Um, and Yolanda is here to let you know, Yolanda Romero or Linda can let you know about Mount Peace. But I did get approached by cops, et cetera, you know, so be careful. That was fun. As, as long as we know you're coming in, you're always welcome. Thanks, Yolanda. Mm -hmm. So now, um, uh, someone comments that their 11-year-old was listening and thought the project sounded fun. Uh, thank you for the inspiration. And an audio tour would be great. Hint, hint. And so just telling you there right now, like this is the imagination that that's, that's I love Plant, this is planting seeds. We, me and Manira, Mrs. Higgs, planted the seeds of these postcards. One of the teachers, Miss Cobia, is doing a virtual tour each week of the five cards. She's getting in her car while the students are on Zoom and driving around. She got chased by the wild turkeys today at Mount Pis at Mount Peace. The students see her driving. They're like, Miss Cobia, I see you outside from my house. So. Mm -hmm. I love the idea that is on my list of ideas to do. Okay. Here's another one. Have you thought about selling the postcards to residents? Of course, yes. Yeah. And another one from um, Charlotte Brown asks, Reverend Benson's ancestors were buried in what cemetery in Lawnside? 
Yeah. So I believe they're at one of the church cemeteries. I have to think for a second. I can tell you for sure. Oh, you can actually go to snowhillgenealogy.com and there are the uh, the biographical timelines and you can choose uh, the Benson brothers. Okay. Someone else asked, uh, this is Denise Sellers is asking, is there any plan to create sets of postcards that teachers at other local schools could purchase to use? That is my dream. Postcards for everybody. So definitely any teachers, anyone who's interested in, you know, doing this, it's a fabulous idea. Um, definitely feel free to email me at genealogyquickstart.com. I would love to talk to you about it. Great. So here's another question from Sherilyn. How did William still come to live in Lawnside? So I do um, not, I'm not doing specific um, research on William still. Linda or someone else, would you like to comment on William Still? Because I do, my research with William Still is Underground Railroad, Philadelphia. I don't believe that William Still lived in Lawnside proper. Uh, he lived in uh, Shemung, in the Shemung area. Their family settled there. And then he eventually went to Philadelphia, uh, to the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. But, but that's a question that you can uh, learn more about but certainly Lawnside is um, home to a large contingent of stills and it's the site of the still family reunion uh, every August. So that's why people may have the impression. And that, one of the things oh, that's really oh. important that we talk about William Still, we talk about the Underground Railroad. One of his buddies who is like an undercover guy, I've, I, I'm enjoying doing the postcards because because of my genealogy research, I've learned so I learned other people. And Jacob C. White Sr. is the um, uh, he was one of William Still's inspectors. He helped to decipher to determine whether these people were really under you know trying to get away or whether they were trying to bust up the underground railroad and he brought a lot of land in lawnside the 1844 map that jake uh, ralph smith we hear about ralph smith ralph smith jacob c white was right there so he is i would say as far as lawnside goes an underground railroad um, and William Still, William Still's buddy is a lot more connected to Lawnside than William Still himself is. So I'm highlighting that to the youth. I'm highlighting that to them. Okay, great. Now, Whitney Polk asked, if we are interested in early Snow Hill Haddonfield genealogy, where might we begin? So um, generally, you're going to begin with an individual. Um, if there are specific individuals, like I do, a, if you are looking up individuals, I do a show genealogy quick start and genealogy starts with foundational records, census records. So you want to start with 1940, you know, of course, you're going to talk to your family, but you want to see who was living in 1940, start 1940 and work your way back 10 years at a time and use vital records to fill in, um, Yes, and if there are specific people like my Snow Hill genealogy, I'm trying to get it out there now. That's why I'm stopped being this collector and I'm trying to put it in a way that I can share. But um, feel free to email me <laughs> with specifics and if I can help. Great. Um, Lisa Duggan says, can you talk briefly to the origin of Lawnside as a planned community? So origin story is one that I am so still working on as far as what is the real origin story. You know, we hear constantly about uh, Matt Ralph Smith creating uh, the 1844 map. You know, we all know it was there before 1844. <laughs> it was there way before 1844. And so um, the early story is, you know, uh, a lot of the folks that lived there were working in Haddonfield. My, um, what um, I'm just uncovering is just trying to um, really document people 
and look at the census records and recreate the lives of those people. And that will help me tell the story of Snow Hill. But I'll tell you one thing I've learned through the newspapers about the town as a whole that's showing you that they had a sense of like a really deep sense of community. Um, uh, center Township before all the towns had their, their own names, kind of, there was the center township. And when they decided that all, all the towns were going to be, uh, be towns, they were going to break lawn side up again, uh, into pieces into all of the different towns. It was going to disappear into Haddonfield, into, not, into uh, Magnolia, and all the towns around. But the people in Lawnside said, whoa, 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 whoa whoa, whoa, we're going to stay a town. So when Center Township broke up, that's when they became uh, more solidified as Snow Hill. And guess what? Snow Hill still stays on the map today. And I'm Lin Linda and I, I still ask around. Paul, I would love to talk. That's part of, that's one of my questions on my Paul uh, list to ask Paul. Why does Snow Hill continue to show up on the present day map today. So my origin story, I don't know if that helped, but my origin story as a community, people being a community, just reading the newspapers um, helps to bring that. One other story is the beginning of, with uh, uh, Richard Allen and him starting the uh, AME Church. Um, that was a huge, huge, huge decision for those uh, Methodists who were churching in Lawnside. They were together and that was where the split came out, Pisgah, Mount Zion. That was a huge word, community where uh, uh, was kind of established. And I'm sure that there are other stories, but the origin story, I'm working on it. And I'm, I'm trying to get these youth to want to work on it. The more work on it, the more we can get to the truth instead of regurgitating the same thing. Well, Paul Shop has a comment too that people might like to know that Mount Pew Cemetery is a National Register listed site, um, and he prepared the nomination. Thank that you, Paul. Added to the register in July 2009. People might also like to know that the Peter Mothouse Underground Railroad Museum is a National Register site in 1994. Uh, Gail Greenberg uh, prepared that nomination and that the Lawnside School Building, now uh, called the Meadows, is also on the National Register of Historic Sites. And I believe that that came along in 2017 or 18. So uh, for a town of uh, less than two square miles to have three National Register sites, my personal dream is that Mount Zion and Mount Peace could be added to the register um, in a theme or a district kind of um, uh, nomination, a uh, hint to uh, any, anybody who might be interested in preparing that register nomination. Um, someone, someone asked, Mimi asked, um, it wasn't only Lawnside vets who were buried in the cemetery, correct? Oh, uh, definitely, definitely. Brown, or were there really 150 men from Lawnside who fought? Oh, most of them came, they came from all over. Most of them were born in New Jersey, uh, Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania, but they came from all over and their desire was to be buried in Lawnside. There's a guy who came from as far as Maryland. So, oh my goodness, came all the way from Maryland. Their desire was to be with other African-American soldiers. They wanted to be buried in an African-American town. Shamel, one thing you should point out as well is that at the turn of the century when Mount Peace opened, African-Americans couldn't be buried in white cemeteries because of race. So a lot of them came to Mount Peace for that reason and Mount Pisgah and, and uh, Mount Zion as well. Thank you, Yolanda. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the um, Mount Peace Register nomination makes for a fascinating reading, and it is uh, more than book length, so it's over 100 pages, and you can actually uh, download it on the National Park uh, Service site um, and access the PDF there. So uh, it, it is really fascinating reading and um, uh, very extensive. Any other questions? 
I have one for you, um, Shamel. <clears throat> you talked about uh, different projects with with working with young people. Um, how? What's the next step? Do you see yourself going into high school? I would enjoy sharing um, history in your backyard with all youth regardless of, you know, because Dr. Johnson, you know, my sweet spot was eighth grade, you know, eighth grade. Then to this year, I was going to say middle school. And he said, we're doing all the way down to third grade. I was really nervous with the little guys, but the little guys are the funnest. They are so much fun. The third grade is actually showing everybody out. They really are. <laughs> so I would enjoy the opportunity to spend time with high school students to see what that dynamic brings because I'm sure uh, their creativity would be off the charts. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I guess, and Sarah is asking what's next for you and, and not necessarily just with students, but what, what's next, what do you have? Um, as far, so, um, so much, I'm having so much fun. Um, I am continuing to do my show regularly um, and I'm doing uh, this Black History Month. I have two black uh, programs, new programs, and one was this Lawnside Postcard, History Postcard, and the other is I'm doing a Freedmen's Bureau experience. And so I'm a genealogical lecturer and I have decided, you know, this virtual world has given us an opportunity to really do education in a more hands-on way, believe it or not, you know, at home. So I am doing, instead of doing a, a one hour, just kind of throwing information at people, I've created what I'm calling an experience. It's a two hour experience where you're doing hands-on work and you are collaborating in breakout rooms with people who are researching the same state as you. And so I am trying to just, um, provide as much different education because people want to know who they are and I want to help. <laughs> so um, such a great thing to get the next generation directly engaged. Um, thanks for the presentation. And I just have a, a question. You mentioned cahoots as a game. Can you just explain what that, what that is to those of us who don't know or understand it? And, and how that's going to work for the Snow Hill Games, as you Yes, say. yes. So at the end of the month of the Lawn South Postcard um, program, we're going to play Snow Hill Games. And I'm like the kids, they, I've ordered over 600 prizes. I don't even know if they're going to fit in here. So they're going to get all these prizes. And so based off of the 20 cards, we're, uh, Mrs. Higgs and I are creating multiple choice questions. And we're going to put, they go up online and people, the, the students will use their devices. They're going to create fun names. Maybe not. I don't know, because they might get too fun. Um, and they're going to answer multiple, cor, cor, excuse me, multiple choice questions based off of lawn side history. And after each question, it shows who's in the lead, you know, and it's just fun. They get, they, they love challenges. And at the end, there's a podium of, you know, third, second and first in honorable mention and we're going to give out prizes and I have friend uh, from Galveston Texas that sent out Juneteenth t-shirts to give to the students and um, it's going to be fun I, I think I went over what Kahoot was did I say Kahoot did I talk about it I'm so busy talking about the students yeah <laughs> thanks thanks so much I think it's an outstanding presentation. That's from Doug Rauschenberger. Thank you. Outstanding Detective. and informative. Can I just tell you guys some books because you guys are being really quiet. If you're interested in Civil War soldiers, African-American Civil War soldiers, this is one. James McPherson, amazing. And really, he doesn't write this book. He is just pulling out the information from the soldiers. So the soldiers and the African-Americans themselves are the text of this book. There is a man, an amazing man, Donald Scott. He wrote a book on Kent William Penn. This book is so heavy, I can barely hold it up. Like it's really thick. So if you want to know Kent William Penn, this man has been studying Kent William Penn. We've been begging him to write a book and he did it. 
And as far as the Civil War soldiers go, you know, they had a, a tough way to go, you know, trying to get their, their, their pensions. And so someone wrote a book called After the Glory, The Struggle of Black Civil War Veterans, Donald Schaefer. So I love books. <laughs> That's really great. And if I could add one, I would add on the altar of freedom. Um, and James McPherson does a foreword for that. And that, that are the letters of Henry Gooden, who was a Civil War soldier. Um, and, and interestingly enough, there's mention in, in that book about the 22nd U.S. Colored Regiment, which a lot of people don't know. And some of the people are very in these cemeteries were in the 22nd regiment. So there's more than more than a handful from the 22nd regiment and the 22nd regiment was huge. They were baddies like they say baddies today. They were baddies cuz they fought they um they were at Appomattox. They um they chased after they were sent after Lincoln's assassins. They were a part of Lincoln's um cemetery procession. So they were huge, the 22nd Regiment. And there, these guys, some of them are buried right here in Lawnside. Thank you, Linda, for reminding me. Some of them are from Lawnside. Some yes. of them are from Lawnside. We're in New Jersey, yeah. So we did Joseph get Brewster was Excellent. one of them. Yeah. Joseph Brewster was one of them. Excellent. Excellent. Um, someone asked again for the veterans book. Could you give that title again? After the Glory. Yes, After the Glory. Donald Schaefer, mm -hmm. and and the um the, on the yeah on the altar of freedom um is the letters of Henry Gooding, G O O D I N G. Yeah. And and someone mentions that uh, Sarah says we can send out these book titles in an email afterwards, so we'll follow up with that too. How are we doing on time? Do we have more time? Yeah, it's about 8 o'clock, so you're good. If you want to, is there anything else you want to talk about? We'd love to hear it. Quite what you're, what you're doing. Oh, yes, the oh. Underground Railroad Museum, Linda, go. Yeah, so the Peter Monhouse Underground Railroad Museum is at 26 Kings Court in Lawnside. It was opened in 2001. It's a national register site, and it's also on the state register of historic places. We are not open to the public at the moment because of the pandemic. And we are excited to have done this program today because this is our first virtual uh, program. But we are revamping our website, and we will be up and running. Um, we can do PowerPoint presentations and certain digitized kinds of tours to give people a look inside the house, but we're really trying, uh, working now with a consultant to uh, do a better job of bringing uh, visual uh, access to the Peter Mott house during the pandemic. But uh, you can go to uh, uh, Facebook slash Lawnside Historical Society to see more about our programming and what we're doing. And one of the students during the meetup this uh, last week, he says, do you know that the Peter Mott house is right in my backyard? And I said, yeah. And he, he said it five times in a minute. Would you like to see it, Miss Jordan? I said, I said, I would love to see it. So he turned his laptop around. Do you see it? And I said, yeah, he was so excited. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of enthusiasm you want. And you're bringing that to the children in our community. Um, any more questions? Oh, there's one. You know, were the teachers you talked about middle school teachers also? Yes, yes. Mrs. Kobe is a uh, like third grade teacher. So she's like rocking those little kids. They are just... Yeah, she's very high energy and a product of Lawnside Schools herself. I don't see any more questions. We can talk uh, ad, ad infinitum <laughs> about a lot of things, but we, we won't do that to people. 
Uh, this, well, this has been awesome. You guys, this is a lot of information. Um, it's just an amazing presentation. And, and what I'd like to do is follow up with an email to the people who signed up through your group and through Eventbrite um, with the email, with the, the books you recommended and any other you know, websites or whatever. We can sort of send a little information packet afterwards. Um, well, tomorrow, <laughs> not today. <laughs> I just want to do a shout out to to um, uh, Charlotte and Ken Brown of Jersey City who have uh, created a play called Lawnside that we uh, premiered last year uh, for Black History Month. It was a tremendous success and uh, we're so grateful to them and uh, we're so glad that they are staying connected uh, with us. They've, they've been a tremendous help. Linda, we missed a question. Oh, okay. And this is a question. Why did the town become named Lawnside instead of staying Snow Hill? And that's from Jack Tardine. So go, go Chanel. Oh, so there are so many stories, right? And I'm trying to get to the bottom of that. And so each story I'm trying to research one at a time, right? So, uh, oh no, that's the story of why it's Snow Hill. So why did it become Lawnside? So they say because possibly of that, the station was Lawnton train station that was right there. And so that's the reason why it's called Lawnside. I thought you asked me the bigger question, so I won't even answer that because nobody cares. Nobody's asked me that. Yeah. Well, why did it, instead of staying Snow Hill? And so we know there was a connection to the railroad station. At one point, there was a name Denton, I think in 1907, uh, and that didn't last long. And then we got into Lawnton side, which was the Lawnton farm. And that was what the conductor allegedly said, get out on the Lawnton side. And then it was shortened to Lawn side. Oh, someone asked about um, the Tuskegee Airmen. The Tuskegee Airmen on the History Channel. I don't think we had any Tuskegee Airmen in our community, but we did have members of the um, the um, uh, uh, 92nd Division Buffalo Soldiers. Lots of 10th Cavalry uh, people in the, in the cemeteries as well. Um, Charlotte Brown is asking, has any thought been given to doing some work on Mount Peace Cemetery? We have been chased by wild turkeys and fallen into uneven grounds, um, renovations in the future uh, are needed. Yes, very much so. And I, I can address that, that for you. Association is working on. Go, I, can, Rhonda. I can address that. Um, it costs money. That's the bottom line. And we are, we are maintaining the grounds that have been cleared so far from the meager de donations that we've gotten over the years. Um, and just, we're, we're working on it. There's a group, a, a group right now that's starting to clear the back end. Mm -hmm. But we've, we've got a long way to go before. We've actually filled in uh, the uneven grounds a couple of times when um, Lionsgate was built. We got a lot, uh, a lot of landfill from them and filled it in. But unfortunately, the cemetery is built over underground streams. And what happens is it all sinks again. Every time we put fill in, it sinks again. So yeah, I, and I can't help you with, with the turkeys. <laughs> Nobody do anything with those turkeys. I got to take a video. I have not been officially not, uh, what do you call it? Whatever. Indoctrinated. Yes, there, I have not been indoctrinated. There was actually a gang war out there last year between the turkeys and the geese. And and the geese lost. <laughs> turkeys kicked their butts. <laughs> we, we had feathers everywhere. <laughs> you know, so I stay away from them myself. But Yolanda, do you mind speaking a little bit about how much more land there is to be cleared in terms there's of about the there's about three my my best guess is there's about three acres in the back. And I have your, your fabulous brother-in-law along with Dolly, uh, Dolly Marshall and a young man named Mikey Passio have been working on clearing that back area. But there, it, it's, it's literally three people that are doing it, you know? So it's, it's a huge job and 
they've made a lot of progress, but the, the problem that we have is that you still have, once you clear it, you have to maintain it. You know, so what my father worked on um, when he first got involved in the, in, I guess it was the late 70s, early 80s, the entire cemetery was, uh, looked like the back all the way down to 30. And his, his generation spent 22 and a half years clearing up to what we have now. And I took over 21 years ago when he died and we've tried to maintain what he did. And now Dolly is the next generation. She's trying to work on getting the back cleared. So, you know, if, if we can get, and David Zally from ShopRite has paid to cut the grass in the front part. And our volunteer, um, Neil, but uh, Neil Butler cuts the back part. So, um, you know, we've, we've got a lot to do, but very little money. That's, that's the biggest challenge. So we're in the process of uh, applying for a 501c3. We had a 501c13, but a lot of the corporate donors won't donate to a 501c13. So Dolly's applied for the uh, 501c3 about a month ago. So as soon as that goes through, we can start uh, uh, doing grants. And um, we, we've already talked to the National Historic Trust and they're gonna work with Dolly on you know, putting together some grants. And we've got a couple other folks who have volunteered to help us with that once that's done. Yeah. What, one of the, um, one of the questions is, um, that Lawnside has national significance, has the historical society considered applying for a national trust African-American action fund grant, the cemetery would be a great project. And so there's, here, so yes, the, the society has submitted, um, letters of intent, um, to the national trust, uh, AACF, uh, project and, um, uh, we're hopeful. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're hopeful. The other thing, Yolanda, if people wanted to volunteer to help at the cemetery, who should they contact? What is the call my, call my number 856-546-9069. And I will put you in touch with Dolly who coordinates the, the volunteers. Groups, individuals, all hands are welcome. Anybody that wants to, we've kind of we've kind of kept the group small this year because of the pandemic. We had a group out there last week that was about ten, but they were distanced from each other, so it, it was a little manageable. But we are very mindful of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we would expect folks to be masked if they come out there at this point. Yeah, and and a note that one of the students in the Lawnside project. Makai is on uh, the call this evening, and he uh, also went to the Lawnside play in uh, Jersey City last year. So he, he's, uh, I think. Uh, That's he, Elizabeth and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, I'm Elizabeth. So <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. You, you have you have hooked someone. Um, Makai has gotten a history bug and. <laughs> um, really into uh, drama too. So I know he's interested in the next production um, in, in Elizabeth. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> Is there any video of the play Denise uh, Sellers asked. Um, yes, we have the well, play. Go ahead. Yes, we have the play, but we're not, we're in the process of copywriting it. And we're also working with the Elizabeth Board of Education. So we can't do anything with our plays yet. Okay. Okay. Because mm -hmm. okay. they're, they're adding that into the Amistad. Amistad, Amistad curriculum. For curriculum. The, for for 21. Okay. 22 school year. Okay. City of Elizabeth. Right. Wonderful. Congratulations on that. That's no small feat. Mm -hmm. 
is amazing. Thank you guys. Um, I don't know if anybody has any more questions, um, but as I said before, we'll send out an email to everybody um, that had signed up through Eventbrite and or wants to log onto our website and we'll get the list of those books and any other information you want. Your phone number that you just mentioned, I'll put that That's up. fine. That's fine. Yeah. So, um, That's fine. Yeah, this is fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. A lot of information. So I, I, unless there are any questions, we'll, we'll end it, but we'll follow up, like I said, um, tomorrow. So this was fabulous. And um, I want everybody to have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. No. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well done, Shamel. Well done. Excellent. Thanks. Very well done. Bye, Linda. Bye-bye. <laughs>